In doing this retrospective, I've tried to set a few basic guidelines for myself, like how I'm sticking to Disney villains that originated in animation. The first time I really broke away from that was my video on theme park characters. Now I'm playing the My Series My Rules card once again, so I can talk about the Brave Little Toaster, which is sort of Disney. Toaster finds itself in an odd category. It was originally conceived as a Disney movie, and the company put some money into it, but it was transferred to Hyperion Studios for most of the production. Many of the people working on the movie were either former Disney animators, or went on to have careers at Disney, and the movie's two sequels were produced as Disney films. Disney has also released a couple pieces of official Toaster merchandise in the form of collectible pins. What I'm trying to say is, you can argue that this is not a Disney film, but you can also argue the opposite. Since I'm including it in my series, you can guess which stance I'm choosing. More than that, Toaster is a very personal, very important film to me. If I have the excuse to talk about these characters, I will definitely take it. Like in my Fox and the Hound video, I interviewed Jerry Rees about his work on the movie. He was an animator for Fox and the Hound, but he did a little bit of everything for Toaster. Directing, writing, animating, voice acting, and more. I'll have the full interview up in a separate video. As always though, before we can take the perilous journey to the City of Light, we need to look at the source material. The story began as a novella by Thomas M. Dish, The Brave Little Toaster, a bedtime story for small appliances. It concerns five appliances living in a summer cottage. A toaster, an electric blanket, a radio, a lamp, and a vacuum. When their owner, referred to as the master, stops visiting the cottage for several summers, the appliances assume it's because something's happened to him. The brave little toaster declares they must set out to find him. Household appliances were not meant to survive in the outside world, but our heroes manage to trek through the wilderness and then a garbage dump before finally finding the master's apartment. They are horrified to discover that their dream reunion is not to be. The master has gotten married, and his wife, the mistress, doesn't care for the countryside, so the cottage is going to be sold. Worse still, the master has lots of new appliances, and no need for the old ones. The story does have a happy ending. The appliances call into a radio show where listeners can make trades. They trade themselves to an elderly woman in exchange for a basket of kittens, pleasantly surprising the master and his wife. The appliance's new mistress takes good care of them, and our heroes are happy to feel needed once more. It's a sweet little story, and although the animated movie took things in a darker, more cinematic direction, the core message remains the same. Appliances love their humans and would do anything for them, even if we don't notice or truly appreciate it. Some of the characters' plights are reminiscent of Lady and the Tramp. The dogs are great companions, but they have no agency. A lot of the problems they find themselves in could be resolved if they could just talk to their masters, but alas, they cannot. The appliances have it even harder, since the fact that they're alive at all must remain a secret. They are built to serve humanity, but humanity regards them with callous indifference. That's hard enough, but an oblivious world is a conflict, not a villain. We'll be zeroing in on the specific foes that the Toaster and its friends encounter in their attempts to find their master. As we'll see, the level of malice varies depending on the character. The first villain is an odd example, because while he's evil, he's not real. I'd be remiss not to discuss the horrifying clown that Toaster sees in one of its nightmares. Despite having less than 10 seconds of screen time, he terrified countless children, myself included. In the book, the Toaster's nightmare is described offhandedly as a joke. The narrator mentions the Toaster waking from a horrible dream about almost falling into a bathtub full of water. Of course a toaster would be afraid of this. The movie not only turns this into a full-fledged horror scene, it also ties it into the toaster's own anxieties about losing its master. We see a moment of bliss with the young master making toast, only for a fire to break out. The smoke carries the master off, and a clown dressed as a firefighter rises to menace our hero, spraying a stream of water that turns into forks. Another logical fear for a toaster to have. Jerry explained that he imagined this as a recurring anxiety dream the toaster has. That was an interesting villain because it's a, it's a villain that's born out of the toaster's own guilt dream. And in my mind, that would be a recurring nightmare that, that, that the toaster has had. Um, after like time has gone by and it feels like the, the, what happened to the master? Where did he go? Where did the kid go? Why isn't he coming back? Maybe he doesn't like us anymore. Maybe, 
maybe I caused it, maybe something, maybe I didn't make toast well enough. <laughs> and I think maybe so that dream to me was like a guilt dream that probably could have been a recurring nightmare for, for this toaster. Of course, it's silly to us humans, but from an appliance point of view, where their function is their entire reason for being, it almost makes sense. This and several other scenes show that although the toaster is brave, it's also quite unsure of itself and has a secret vulnerable side. Jerry also mentioned that the clown was directly inspired by the sadistic clowns in Dumbo who torment the little elephant. The clown's singular line was performed by Joe Ranft. Ranft also provided some truly maniacal laughter that sort of gets swallowed up by the blaring orchestra. Luckily for us, one of the movie's animators, Steve Seagal, took home movies during production and shared them on YouTube. The footage shows a story reel of the nightmare scene without the music, allowing us to hear the laugh more easily. I realize it's a little absurd to go on for so long about a character who barely exists within the story, but I really had to give this clown his due. Despite how brief his appearance is, he's an iconic part of the movie. He reminds us that no matter how brave you are, no matter how warm and kind you are, no matter how far you'll go to save the ones you love, you can still be afraid of clowns. So the clown was kind of a stretch, and the same goes for the next character, the first human our heroes properly encounter. In the book, the appliances reach a dead end when they come to a river. They find a boat and decide to borrow it to float across. The boat's owner arrives a moment later and assumes the appliances belong to someone who's trying to steal this boat. He responds in kind by stealing the appliances. This is certainly upsetting, but things get even worse when we find out he lives in the city dump, which might as well be a graveyard. The junk man thief, who the appliances call a pirate, deems them all to be trash except for the radio which he keeps. The other appliances disguise themselves as a ghost. The pirate sees his own wicked face reflected in the toaster and hightails it out of there. The friends reunite with the radio and continue on their journey. We don't get to spend much time with the pirate, which is probably for the best, because the narration makes it very clear he's a pretty rotten person. The movie takes a different approach. This time, the human isn't really a thief, nor is he all that bad. Elmo St. Peter's finds the appliances sinking in the mud and rescues them, loads them up in his monster truck, and takes them out of the wilderness and into a shop. Unfortunately, it's a parts shop. If the city dump is a cemetery, this shop is where you go before you die. The parts hanging from the walls might as well be arms and legs. Suddenly, this amusing fellow doesn't seem like the savior they thought he was. Like, your first impression of him is that he's, he's like, he came at the last second, he's the cavalry. He's like, he yeah. saved them. And, uh, so you feel all happy and he's this not jovial, nice guy. And he's, he never is a villain villain, but oh my gosh, it's, it, re, it, it is, it may as well be full out villainy because he's dismembering <laughs> the appliances. But you know, in the world of humans, that's, that's a thing you do. You take a part from one and you, you know, if you can use that part somewhere else you do. And so having a part shop is the equivalent to like an organ shop of like selling kidneys. It's true that Elmo is not 100% honest. At one point, he sells a customer a used blender motor as a new product and almost does the same thing to the radio's parts. Still, he seems genuinely friendly and really cares about his dog. <laughs> Good boy, quadruped. You remembered your seatbelt. Aside from the questionable business practice, nothing St. Peter's does suggests any true malice. He doesn't know the appliances are alive. It's all a matter of perspective. It's sort of like man in Bambi. He could be anyone, but most likely he's just some guy hunting in the woods. To the animals, his victims, he's a monster they can never truly comprehend. The scene where St. Peter's dismantles a blender sums this up excellently. From our point of view, he's just doing his job, but the appliances are witnessing a murder. The oil dripping afterward even resembles blood. Part of Elmo's charm is his goofy voice, again supplied by Joe Ranft. When pitching the movie, Jerry and Joe would act out different character voices, with Joe doing this one for fun. Jerry liked it so much, he offered him the part. We'd have the storyboards pinned up and, you know, he'd go, huh, good boy, quadruped, you remembered your seatbelt. You know, it's like, just that kind of thing. It just cracked me up 
And so I just went, Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to use you. It's like, I'm, I, cause I was finding other people to cast and I went for him, I, I'm going to use you. And he was like, why? No, we should. And I said, no, Joe, I'm going to use you. And he went, really? Yeah. And so it, like to him, it was a, it was kind of a big thing. And, and when he did that final scream where he was scared by the characters and, uh, you know, I was really like having him go for it. And I think he was really exhausted after that. <laughs> Ramph would land the role of Heimlich the Caterpillar in A Bug's Life more or less the same way. He went on to play a key role in many of the early Pixar features, working on the stories, scripts, and voices. I feel like Sid in Toy Story was partially inspired by Elmo St. Peter's. He's a lot more unruly, but he's also a child who doesn't know the toys he tortures are alive. Both Elmo and Sid also seem to have a fondness for customization. Sid has his well-known mutant toys, but Elmo has a mishmash of different parts that he seems to have put together for his own amusement. All the other appliances in the shop have lost their minds, thanks to living in this endless horror movie. While they do taunt the main characters through a thriller-inspired musical number, it comes off more as a bizarre initiation ritual. Once Toaster succeeds in scaring the daylights out of St. Peter's, everyone makes a run for it, leaving a very confused shop owner in their wake. The movie's score was an early work by David Newman, who has raked up many more credits since then. It's easily one of my favorite soundtracks, to the point where it really got me into movie scores in the first place. One thing I admire is how he weaves the five appliance themes into some fairly complex pieces of music. The only villain per se to get their own theme is St. Peter's, which is handled very well. When we first meet him, it's bright and quirky. Then, once the appliances realize exactly where they are and who this person is, it gets a lot creepier. Elmo St. Peter's is not a traditional villain. Someone overseas must have missed that memo. Home video box art for these kinds of movies often frame the hero in the foreground with the villain looming off to the side, looking as menacing as possible. On the German video cover, for whatever reason, they chose a truly wrathful-looking St. Peter's, ready to strike the heroes down. I don't get it either. The magnet would have been a much more logical choice. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As I said in the plot recap, the book has our intrepid heroes find that their master has replaced them with new appliances. For example, he has a different toaster and a newer, more modern vacuum. The blanket is actually upset that it doesn't have a counterpart, new or otherwise. Finding out that the mistress doesn't like electric blankets makes it even worse. The whole situation is uncomfortable for everyone involved. The new appliances are polite, but there's an unspoken understanding between them that this isn't their choice, it's the master's. After the initial awkwardness, the toaster and friends tell everyone about their adventures, and the mistress's sewing machine repairs the blanket, who got torn up during a storm. When the five main characters go off to live with their new owner, there doesn't appear to be any hard feelings toward the master's new appliances. This is a cozy way to end the story. Slightly bittersweet, but the protagonists ultimately get what they've been looking for, someone who needs them. As pleasant as this is, it doesn't make for an exciting movie. In the film, things play out very differently. Rob, the master, is not a married adult, but instead a young man ready to go to college. His family is selling their vacation cabin, but he's actually been planning to pick up the toaster and the others to use in his dorm. Ironically, he leaves just as they arrive. Meanwhile, his new sleek appliances are aghast that he wants to take a bunch of old stuff instead of them. Then the old appliances show up on their doorstep, and the jealous new machines get an idea. My favorite thing about this group is their amazing character designs. They don't appear for very long in the story, but they come in a great variety and leave a large impact. The character designers really outdid themselves with not only these characters, but the whole movie. The meadow and junk shop sequences also feature a number of distinct ensemble characters who we barely get the chance to see. One of the designers, future director Kevin Lima, was generous enough to share lots of great concept art online. The leader of the apartment appliances is a computer voiced by Randy Bennett. They're all smug about their superiority, but he comes off as the most proud of himself. Naturally, we are on the cutting edge of technology. Just like in the book, every appliance, except for the blanket, has their own fancier counterpart. Toaster meets a toaster oven. Radio is against a stereo. Lampy has to compare himself to several lamps. 
One is definitely modern, but another one, Plugsy, just appears to be an ordinary purple lamp. Despite him not really fitting in with the rest of the Cutting Edge group, he still manages to be memorable. He gets some of the best expressions, and his gangster-sounding voice from Jim Jackman is great. How do you do? Terry, not upon our doorstep. Please, feel free to enter. All of you. Meanwhile, Kirby encounters a canister vacuum that appears to be two living creatures in one. The main section and the suction hose both have a set of eyes. They were conceived as having a snake-like movement, but their short screen time doesn't let this come across. Another multiple personality case is the sewing machine, whose faces are sat next to each other. It's literally two-faced, gossiping about the others one moment and putting on a false smile the next. Really, all the new appliances are two-faced in this way. This one is just the most obvious from a visual standpoint. Their simultaneous dialogue performed by Mindy Stern and Judy Toll is one of the movie's highlight performances. Both actresses can be heard elsewhere in the movie. Stern plays Rob's mother, and Toll is the mishmash creature of Elmo St. Peter's. Other characters include the Entertainment Center, voiced by special effects wizard Randall William Cook, and a cute little egg beater. The new appliances drop their nice guy act pretty quickly, and aggressively boast about how superior they are to the old group. Dropping a techno beat, they sing the movie's villain song, Cutting Edge, written by Van Dyke Parks. Parks has a somewhat quirky songwriting style that suits the movie perfectly. Jerry Rees actually helped out with the lyrics for this one. Uh, for Cutting Edge, I really participated a lot with that one, more than any other one. He really said he felt at, at, um, quite at a loss to, to really get going with that. And so there were things like the the last list in the song, you know, the ultra nylon life of beads, all that stuff. I, I would write strings of dialogue out like that, uh, lyrics, and send them to him because he was like not familiar with the terms and stuff. So I would do s strings of rhymes and calling stuff out like that. And then he also brought in some people that were uh, that were used to doing more like uh, electronic music and stuff like that to collaborate with him. So that was an unusual piece for him. The song is very in your face. It might not work that well out of context, but it fits in very well with the story being told. The vocal arrangements, the synth, the aggressive more, more, more that they keep repeating sounds a lot like actual commercials from that time period. The thousand yard stare Toaster has at the end of the song says it all. These guys are better than them. Their master doesn't need them anymore. Then, to drive the point home, the new appliances almost literally kick them to the curb launching the group out the window and into the dumpster. When our heroes reach the dump, they heartbreakingly accept their fate. This is just how the world works. The Cutting Edge appliances don't receive any direct comeuppance for trying to kill their rivals, which in turn inadvertently almost leads to the death of their beloved master. The most we see is a very sad plugsy when Rob turns down bringing the new appliances to college. You almost, almost feel sorry for him. This group of characters is arguably the most evil in the movie, but they do love their master. That's one of the recurring themes. The appliances are 100% dedicated to the master and would do anything for him, good or bad. The thing is, the end is in sight for a lot of these new machines, even if they don't realize it. They boast about how dated the old ones are, but by today's standards, these guys are even more out of style. This wasn't even intentional, but it's helped the story in the long run. At the time the movie came out, that was all absolutely cutting edge stuff like the, you know, per big screen projection TVs and stuff like that was, was at the time was, was cutting edge. Uh, it's just over the years, uh, it becomes the old thing. <laughs> it's like somebody proudly showing off VHS tape. It's the latest thing. Well, you know, at one time it was the latest thing. Uh, so yes, that's kind of a funny thing. It's, it's quickly become the, the old fashioned scene is the one bragging about how cutting edge it is. The toaster and friends are built to last. The new appliances are loud and flashy, but they'll soon be replaced by something even newer. Some of them are fine. Plugsy probably isn't going anywhere, but that computer and the telephone won't be on top for that long. Pretty soon they'll be in the dump feeling absolutely worthless. Was that a segue? I think it was. As I said back in the Elmo St. Peter section, the junkyard used to come earlier in the book. It gave the appliances something of a challenge, but with a little teamwork, they were able to escape without that much trouble. In the movie's completely revised ending, it becomes a much more dangerous place. 
Two major features that weren't in the book are a trash masher that compacts the garbage into tiny little cubes, and a magnet that actively seeks out victims to feed it. When we first reach the dump, the magnet is preoccupied with broken down cars. The poor automobiles can no longer drive and are powerless as they take one last short ride on the conveyor belt to the masher. Soon, the magnet sets its sights on the main characters. All the other appliances we see are totally broken, and essentially already dead. Being fed to the trash masher wouldn't really be a big deal. Our heroes may be old, but they're still functioning. They initially accept their fate until they see their master looking for them. They hop off the conveyor belt, much to the magnet's anger. They have just made a powerful enemy. Although the magnet has quite the body count for an animated musical, it's not evil at heart. Jerry explained that it's following its programming. It was built to destroy, and that's all it's good for. In its mind, if the toaster and friends escape, it's not doing its job properly, and could face getting scrapped itself. That's why it continues to pursue them as they repeatedly jump to safety. It's not destroying those cars because it hates them, it's doing it because this is its job, which it takes very seriously. For them to be like getting away from him and again and again, him un being unsuccessful with doing his task, which is to crush them. And now you have this person who's like taking them away, like, no, I'm not gonna let you crush. It's still this feeling like he's being unjustly thwarted from his, his design function in life. When Rob reclaims his cherished possessions, the magnet still insists on doing its job. Rob is just as stubborn and refuses to let go, which leads to him being trapped on the conveyor belt. The magnet is like the HAL 9000. It will do its job at all costs, even if it means killing a human. The contradiction isn't apparent in its one-track mind. Out of all the intense moments in the movie, this is the one that still makes me sweat no matter how many times I watch it. Luckily for everyone, the brave little toaster lives up to the title and throws itself into the masher's gears, face first. Ouch. The machine grinds to a halt, saving Rob and the other appliances. With nothing to feed the trash into, the magnet presumably takes a break until its fellow machine can be repaired. The trash masher doesn't have the same level of sentience as the magnet on the surface, but that's because it really doesn't have to. It's always in view of humans and working continuously. It clearly has a pair of eyes, and the mashing mechanism is a set of relentless teeth. Just like the magnet, it follows its protocol and refuses to stop, even when a human is about to get crushed. I do wonder what it's like on its off time. You might be wondering who's actually overseeing these machines. That would be Ernie, the owner of the junkyard. If you don't remember him, that's because he didn't make it into the final cut of the movie. When the appliances are hauled off, the master's friendly old TV set sees that they're headed for Ernie's disposal. In order to get Rob to find them, it airs a series of makeshift commercials, encouraging him to go to the dump. In each ad, it exaggerates what kind of place Ernie's really is, eventually calling it Crazy Ernie's Amazing Emporium of Total Bargain Madness. That's enough to finally convince Rob and his girlfriend Chris to check it out. A scene was planned where they met Ernie in his trailer upon arrival. Rob asks if he's Crazy Ernie, which really gets under his skin. Apparently, his mother called him crazy. The large, slow-witted man seems confused by the whole thing, which is not helped when Rob mentions bargain madness. Thinking it's some kind of epidemic, Ernie says they can look around and take whatever they want before sequestering himself back inside. The scene was storyboarded, voices were recorded, and some test animation was done of the character, but he was cut for time. Unfortunately, Mr. Reese can't recall who did the voice. This does explain why the magnet works the way it does. With someone like Ernie running, or rather not running, the junkyard, the magnet has full control of what happens. It targets what it wants to target, like some persistent little appliances. There's no one to stop it when it rebels against another human. For those of you who want to see the full rundown of Ernie's deleted scene, and several others, I'll include a link in the description of the video. I should also mention the worthless song that plays during the sequence. A group of cars sing about the lives they lived and the roads they traveled before they were no longer of use. Each one gets crushed into a cube when their verse is done. It makes an effective contrast to the previous Cutting Edge song, and serves a grim reminder that those arrogant appliances will literally be changing their tune someday. Although The Brave Little Toaster was denied a proper theatrical release, it did very well on video. Well enough that when Disney entered their sequel phase, Toaster received two follow-up movies. These movies were fully released under the Disney label. Due to various issues with copyright holders, you cannot find the original Toaster on Disney+, Plus, but you can find the sequels. There's some confusion about the order of the movies. The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars was released first, but the following movie, The Brave Little Toaster to the Rescue, takes place before Mars. 
For some reason, they were released in the correct order in the UK, but not here. For cohesion's sake, it just makes more sense to cover To the Rescue first. The movie picks up at college, where Rob has become a veterinary student. I had him pegged for being an engineer myself. But if they did that, then we couldn't have a menagerie of cute animal characters to take the spotlight. Rob takes his job seriously, but the same cannot be said for his assistant, Mac, voiced by Jay Moore. Mac is quite old for a sophomore, and it's not from a late start. He's been around for a while, and has never bothered to make anything of himself. He's very resentful of Rob, who is younger than him, more successful, has a beautiful girlfriend, and is graduating early. While Rob has fully devoted himself to helping animals, Mac seems to have taken the job because Rob is willing to put up with him for the moment, and because he really needs the money. As in, he has massive gambling debts to pay off. In a pinch, he plots to sell the animals to a testing lab behind Rob's back without a shred of guilt. Hey, come on, they're just animals! I don't really think they have feelings, do you? As a matter of fact, I do. Needless to say, Mac is our villain. They do a good job at making us root against him from the start, with virtually no redeeming qualities. Lazy, creepy, and an animal abuser to boot. While he's probably the most straightforward villain in the whole series, he's not all that interesting. There's also a much greater evil beyond Mac's short-sighted greed. The testing facility, Tartarus Laboratories, is spoken of in hushed whispers by the animals. One of them, a monkey named Sebastian, has experienced their cruelties firsthand and is still recovering. Mac is able to put his plan into action thanks to some accidental interference from an old computer, Wittgenstein. It's actually trying to warn Rob about what Mac is doing, but it's caught a nasty virus and ends up deleting Rob's enormous term paper instead. With Rob distracted, Mac has full access to the animals. The movie's other villain is Jim Bob, a truck driver assisting Mac in transporting the animals. The most notable thing about him is his voice actor. Jonathan Benair previously voiced the black and white TV set in the first Toaster. He's one of the few returning actors for the sequels, along with the voices of Toaster, Kirby, and Lampy. I suppose the viruses infecting Wittgenstein could be considered minor villains. These space invaders looking creatures are the most aggressive computer viruses you've ever seen, physically destroying Wittgenstein's insides. They even have a little sing-song chorus as they go, chomp and munch. The songs in both Toaster sequels had music by William Finn and lyrics by Ellen Fitzhugh. We just heard from Fitzhugh in the Great Mouse Detective video. Finn, meanwhile, is best known for his Broadway work on shows like Falsettos and the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. The score is by Alexander Janko and features a general drama theme closely associated with Mac and Tartarus Laboratories. The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars is an outrageous title, but it wasn't Disney's idea. A year after the first movie came out, Tom Stish released his own sequel to the original book, where Toaster did, in fact, go to Mars. Although I'm not sure how Dish felt about the movie, it should be noted that the appliance characters in the first book did not have strongly defined personalities. In the second book, they behave much more like their animated counterparts. We open with everyone happily living with their new mistress. Also living with them is an old hearing aid she bought at a rummage sale. This is no ordinary hearing aid, however. He's a prototype built by Albert Einstein himself. The hearing aid uses its knowledge to teach the appliances special skills to improve their performance. With this help, Radio is able to pick up signals from Australia and beyond. Without realizing it, Radio begins broadcasting a signal all the way from Mars. The Red Planet is populated by renegade appliances that want to kill all the humans and rule the world themselves. Now Toaster and the others must journey through space to stop their invasion plans. The would-be invaders definitely have their reasons to hate humanity. They were created by a company called Populux, and were to be victims of planned obsolescence. In other words, they would be sold cheaply, but fall apart quickly and need to be replaced. Not wanting to have such short lifespans because of greedy humans, they escaped Earth to plot revenge. Once on Mars, they began to create bigger and stronger appliances, like war toasters, flying vacuums, and giant waffle irons, all to wipe out the people of Earth. Even though only a few of these devices would be enough to carry out their terrible goal, their leader, the Supreme Commander, obsessively orders them to stockpile more and more weapons. The Commander was once a refrigerator, but now sits inside a mammoth fridge, towering over everyone. His partner in crime, so to speak, is the genius appliance that helped them get to Mars in the first place, the hearing aid's twin, Einstein's other prototype. 
the Supreme Commander was, in fact, another Einstein prototype. After Einstein fled to America, the fridge and the other hearing aid were found by one of Einstein's rivals, a Nazi scientist. His evil rubbed off on the two of them, especially the fridge, making them forget their natural love of humanity. Luckily for Earth, the brave little toaster is able to make them all see reason. The story is surprisingly political, with the scenes on Mars feeling reminiscent of Soviet Russia. Remember, this came out in 1988. The movie adaptation dialed this down. A big difference in the film was the Supreme Commander's true identity. Rather than have it be the refrigerator and the hearing aid working together, it simplified to only be the hearing aid, voiced by Alan King. Another, more minor change is the name of the appliance brand from Populux to Wonderlux. The circumstances of why Toaster and Friends go to Mars is a bit different as well. They are unaware of the invasion plans at first, and travel through space to save the little master. The Martian appliances have invited the hearing aid to join them, but instead accidentally abduct Robbie, the child of Rob and Chris. The Supreme Commander is not happy to find out that the Earth appliances remain loyal to the humans. Although it uses its sheer size as a form of intimidation, there's still plenty of good underneath its iron exterior. One touch from the innocent baby is enough to remind it of humanity's better side. All that man listened to was talks of bombs and missiles and warheads. When you live with someone for a long time, it rubs off. I don't think we've seen too many redeemed villains in our retrospective so far. I still think of the Supreme Commander as a bad guy for most of the movie, given that it wants to wipe out all the humans, so it's still worth talking about. Although it's not a true villain song, per se, I should mention that the big debate between Toaster and Commander is done as a musical number. Finn and Fitzhugh both have musical theater backgrounds, and out of all the sequel songs, this one sounds the most like a show tune. It's characters conversing through song, rather than the other, more conventional numbers. Jim Cummings filled in for Alan King as the Commander's singing voice. One of the things Toaster says in the book is that planned obsolescence isn't as much of a problem now as it was when the Populux appliances were first built. I'm not sure how true that is, and I do know that it's still a problem with certain appliances today, like cell phones. Although Jerry Reese has been very open about never watching in the sequels, he actually has his own take on this idea. If he ever makes a sequel of his own, he wants to include some modern characters who are depressingly aware of their very short lifespans. It's amazing how many parts are inside of a toaster. I, I looked up a diagram of all the parts. It's amazing. And so I pictured him going through this ritual of taking everything apart, laying it out, cleaning it beautifully, putting it all back together, and that these modern characters would be looking at this and think, oh my God, it's like an immortal. It's like we would never be repaired. We'd just be tossed. Are you kidding? It's like somebody drops us in the toilet or whatever. They don't, they don't resurrect us. They toss us. And uh, here this person is taking this complicated piece of equipment, this uh, toaster, and and doing surgery on it, like taking it apart, cleaning everything, putting it all back together, and it's alive again. So it would be the like the like they would consider it the immortals. As we approach the video's conclusion, I'd like to take a moment to explain why this film is so important, and why it's touched me and so many others. On the surface, the idea sounds like a very kid-focused story but it's much more than a sweet movie about talking machines. It goes to some intense places. If you do a search for the movie on YouTube, you'll find dozens of videos saying things along the lines of, oh, this is a dark kids movie. How could they show this to kids? Why was this kids movie so scary? These reviews often get hung up on it being scary for kids and tend to overlook the movie's natural strengths. Not to mention, it was never meant to be just a kids movie, not specifically. Is perfectly appropriate for kids, a lot of us watched it at a young age, but it was meant to be a film for everyone. One that kids can enjoy, but adults can take seriously. With a title like The Brave Little Toaster, it had a lot to prove about itself. Its crew rose to the challenge and gave us a great movie. Is it scary? Yes, but it's more than that. There's a lot of heart and personal affection poured into this film. More than most animated movies are allowed. When a big studio is funding things, there's often a sense of risk aversion. They want to do something that a very large mainstream audience can enjoy, but that can often come with a designed-by-committee blandness. These people had a huge amount of creative freedom, and it shows in the final product. The movie is a lot like the main characters. A little rough around the edges, but full of heart and ultimately timeless. I don't know if we'll ever see another movie quite like this one. 
I met my wife because of our shared love of Toaster. These lovable, well-defined characters, especially Lampy and Radio, have a very special place in our hearts. She even made custom Toaster Christmas ornaments. That's why this video feels a little more self-indulgent, and why I went on for quite a while about these characters. We will always be grateful for this brave little toaster. A huge thank you to Jerry Rees for filling us in on all the behind-the-scenes information. There's more depth to that big magnet than you thought. Our next entry is undoubtedly Disney. We're diving into the money bin to talk about the many foes that went up against Scrooge McDuck. It's a Carl Barks tribute video covering the original comics and the different versions of DuckTales. Truly, it is a duck blur. Well, that's all there is to it. That's very interesting. Good night, Slothead.